What is up, Generals? It's Fiasco, and we're back with Ultimate General Civil War. Uh, we are playing the Union Major General campaign, and we have cleaned the army up uh, in the lead-up to the Battle of uh, Gettysburg, I think. In a lot of ways, this is where it's all been... Um, all been leading. This is, you know, the most famous battle of the war, certainly the most famous battle, I think, um, to have occurred on the main continent of the United States with per the perhaps the exception um, of the Battle of Pearl Harbor. Uh, and that's debatable as to where it's occurred. Um, you know, I suppose you could talk about Yorktown or um, the Alamo or, or some of the other battles that have also occurred. But I think in terms of, um, and this is me just guessing, but in terms of media generated and in terms of the impact, in terms of what it had on the war, my understanding is that the Battle of Gettysburg is one of the most, if not the most, um, pivotal uh, battles of the campaign. The army has mostly been cleaned up. Um, units have been raised to their authorized cap of 1,500 or um, basically been raised with raw recruits until one of the following happened. One, they hit the cap, 1500 or two adding an additional raw recruit would cause the perk to go away um and i'm i'm actually okay with these numbers being a bit wonky um some of these numbers not not being uh exactly a round number you know I'm, the thought process in my mind is uh you know historical units you look at the t o and e of these battles these these units have all kinds of not so not so numbers so let's let's make our figures here look a little wild too and, and again my perception of some of the um portions of the army is is that we're a bit um we're a bit big anyway for for this part of the playthrough so uh the union army the confederate army is call it sixty three thousand down from seventy three thousand before chancellorsville which i think is pretty pretty major um, that's a great, uh, force multiplier or force negative multiplier. Um, going into Geisberg, we're going to be suffering, um, a minus 10% enemy army morale effect as a result of the battle of Chancellorsville and, uh, a bit of a discount to their size as a result of the skirmish at second Winchester. Uh, although I hesitate to call that truly a skirmish, um, so despite the numbers hit of approximately 10,000 to their force pool, uh, the training is phenomenal. I am expecting to see three-star units just out the wazoo. Uh, the armory has been hovering in the mid-50s for most of the war, uh, what I, most of what I would call the mid-phase of the war. So that number, to my perception, is not terribly new, um, but the training number is, I think, noteworthy in its height. Um and then the way that we've knocked down the army composition figures is also noteworthy to my perception, uh, presumably as a direct result of uh, Chancellorsville being such a route um, from the Confederate perspective. I don't have any expectation that the figure at the top of the screen here um, really bears any, <laughs> any relationship with reality. Uh, so we'll see. Um, you'll note here that there's no fourth core. I have uh, emptied it. So there's no units that would, there was one artillery unit that was in fourth core. I've dumped it into three core um, and then pulled all of the uh, supply out of the supply wagon as well because I could use that money for other things and there's nothing to do with fourth core. So fourth core is, is a paper core at the moment. Um and uh, the early reinforcements. So I haven't thought about who needs to be where. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's put three core under Grant as the first to fight uh, because this part is largely defensive. We'll get I core coming in second and then two core coming in third. The Union Army stands at just uh, just under 80,000, um, which is not terribly far off from what they were at for the actual battle. I think the Union Army, the Battle of Gettysburg was something around 93,000, and the Confederate Army was like 76 and change. Um, 
my father and I went to the battlefield uh, a while ago. It was a good time. So uh, unfortunately, I think this number here is largely useless in terms of figuring out what enemy force strengths are going to be. Uh, and then also a number of viewers and, and writers have uh, mentioned in their playthroughs that it's not uncommon for uh, significant portions of your army to just never show up. So yay <laughs> uh, to both of those things. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and click the start button, but you guys know the drill. I'll be cutting out the audio on the day of, doing a post recording, speeding the times up, speeding the play back up double because this is kind of a long engagement and I'll be doing um, over commentary for that. So uh, I will uh, see you guys in a few seconds. This is Fiasco for right now, signing out. Okay, so <laughs> I say that, but then <clears throat> immediately I misclick uh, the camp button instead of the start button. So quickly we just jump back in. Uh, three core is the uh, leading edge with one and two bringing up the, I guess, middle and rear. Um, they do a good job of kind of giving you an idea of uh, the opening scenario here. Um, and this should be very familiar to anybody who's played um, uh, the Ultimate General Gettysburg game, and it, which is more recent, uh, but really any of the um, uh media forms that have covered the Battle of Gettysburg will remember, you know, kind of the way that the opening of the battle goes. Um, and this, this is just sort of sort of them just giving you a, a geographic walkthrough. It's it's not surprising to, to me that, um, pardon me, Games Labs uh, decided to make um, the Battle of Gettysburg one of the um, major tentpole um, engagements of their Civil War game because they had previous to this made an entire game um, about just the Battle of Gettysburg. So um, this engagement should look very familiar to anybody who's played that battle because this is really similar to how that plays. You, uh, the players, start off with a whole bunch of um, here they're just here they're just skirmishers, but really they're dismounted cavalry um, with a handful uh, or with with a pair of. Uh, <clears throat> vedette units which is these guys on the far flanks cav units um who are meant to you know just do recon stuff basically um and there's a huge confederate column um coming at you and i'm and i'm trying to like hem them up catch them in the water um you do anything i can as far as like good timing with which to kind of maximize casualties and minimize my risk um but the opening movements of this particular battle do not go well for me uh the um i guess we'll call them the dragoons or the dismounted cav um have a, a harder time than my previous experience of this particular engagement um with um the opening and i think uh, a non-zero portion of that is um the last time i played this was on colonel so it's just a very different game. Uh, I completely forget about the second wave of Confederate units here, so the artillery and the other infantry coming in. So what I thought I was going to be super sneaky with the, those two cav units and come around behind, pick up the supply wagon and get a few pot shots on hill or theoretically even knock out hill, um, it, it just it results in, in me losing almost half of a, of a cav unit and then uh, just completely failing to really... Um, meaningfully slow. Well, no, see, so uh, I say failing to meaningfully slow. I, I think it's pretty obvious I do slow uh, the Confederate advance. It gives me enough time for um, my reinforcing infantry to get into position on the southern ridge. Um, but it would be accurate to say that they fail to stop uh, the Confederate advance, which <clears throat> I suppose all things considered, is a completely accurate or an appropriate kind of response. I'd imagine it's not impossible, but quite rare for um, dismounted cavalry effectively functioning as light infantry to hold up um, uh, three-ish divisions of you know, formed Confederate heavy infantry with appropriate support of what appears to be light infantry and artillery. I'm not seeing any of their own cavalry, but I don't remember there being a significant cavalry. Actually, you know what? 
I was going to say, I don't remember there being a significant Confederate cavalry force at the Battle of Gettysburg, but I now remember um, <clears throat> there, in fact, was no cavalry force at the Battle of Gettysburg, the, and, and, and that was one of the big reasons why things went poorly. Um, <clears throat> and come to think of it, the, uh, the film Gettysburg remarks on this exact fact. Lee continues to lament as to why he doesn't know where Stuart is. Um, and then Stuart doesn't roll up until late, and this leaves Lee effectively blind. Um, so yeah, blah blah blah. No, this, but still, uh, this is formed heavy infantry and uh, artillery along with light infantry support. And I just, you know, I think it's unrealistic to think that um, dismounted cav would hold that up. We would would effectively stop it. Besides, kind of just harassing it. So um, we get our first uh, elements of three core um, coming online, and uh, normally, when I well, I say normally, I've played this battle like twice, uh, and, and both on kernel difficulty. Once back when this game was still in early access, um, <clears throat> and. Uh, it's not because I don't have like, I have like 400, 500 some odd hours in this game. It's just a lot of it is <laughs> when I'm just playing for me, uh, I get bored. Like I get to a point where I feel like, and I play on kernel and that was part of the issue is I'd play on kernel and I get to this point where like the battles weren't challenging anymore. And I'm like, yeah, you know, the union army is so powerful and the Confederates are just kind of shit. So at this juncture in the war, like I'd be fighting, fighting like 500 man units of, you know, uh, dudes with musket, dudes with like dudes with um, farmers or something. It's just it's, you know, it's just not fun at that point. So I get bored and start another campaign and try and like do a thing differently or try a new playthrough strategy or whatever. And Major General was, I'm going to be honest, intimidating for me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, despite the kind of rocky beginning to the Major General campaign, I think that. Um, it's really kind of forced me to up my game and the uh, support from SC and Panikraut, um, have you know, kept the, kept the interest high and the motivation to, to keep this, this series going. Um, along with the fact that I think Major General remains an interesting and intriguing challenge. And I, ha I, I think that I'd have a hard time stepping down to a lower difficulty at this point because I really... You know, I have to. I have to respect the AI. I have to give it the appropriate amount of respect, or it's gonna. Sh it's gonna trounce me. It's gonna show me, you know, the error of my ways. And I think that's fantastic. So uh, back to the battlefield, really quick. We're getting more more elements of uh, three core coming in to support um, what I've got going on in the Southern Ridge. And actually, this is what I was initially talking before I got talking about before I got distracted. Uh, when I last played this battle on Colonel Difficulty and uh, the, well, twice the, the times I played it on Colonel, in both instances, I was able to simply retake the Northern Ridge as well. I was able to, you know, outmaneuver and shoot off the Confederates off of that ridge, take both of the ridges and just hold it. Um, and, and that's obviously just, <laughs> like my read on the battlefield at the moment is that that's just straight up not going to happen. Um, they're, they're continuing to get reinforcements. I, uh, I suppose they probably got two core, no, not two core, a, a, like half of a core, if not a core on the map at the moment. Although you look at the blue and red and we outnumber them. Um, so I should be a little more confident than I am. Um, especially considering that I, I imagine a, a very high percentage of their forces concentrated, um, <clears throat> in, uh, that southern tip of the northern ridge right around that road there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, on the south, I've got a bunch of uh, the dismounted cav and I think one maybe unit of detached skirmishers um, supporting the two cav units that are, are mounted um, and, that, and that's because they just kind of skirmisher swarmed um, this one portion of Archer's Brigade. Uh, and I'm thinking, oh, if I can get four or five skirmish units and two cav units on uh, on that Confederate artillery, uh, even though I have a pretty low opinion of um, 
dismounted skirmishers or de- detached, sorry, detached skirmishers or dismounted cav um, have a low opinion of their ability to uh, destroy batteries. Um, I have a high opinion of their ability to distract or um, shake those batteries. So make the flag go white is what I'm going to call shaking. Um or pinning it would be another way to put it. Pinning it, shaking it, to borrow terms from, um, you know, and a bunch of other war games. Uh, the main main battle line here uh, has a kind of abortive flirtation with the idea of attempting to retake the Northern Ridge. I have a dis- like I, I look at that terrain and I'm like, that's very defensible terrain. I'd love to have both of these ridges. I'd love to get into a position where the Confederate army is just bouncing off of, um, you know, troops on that, on that dug in hill line with, with wooded cover and everything. It's, it's great defensive terrain, uh, but it's, it's not meant to be. They have far too many forces on the map. Um, and, and they're all kind of coming from the same direction. Like, so that Northern Ridge of theirs, uh, now, frankly, theirs is, is very hard to imagine me taking. Um, this opening skirmish is actually very exciting. Uh, it's it's uh, I, I've played this battle uh, a couple of times in the lower difficulties, and it's kind of boring. Um, and then I've I've played the hell out of the first game back when it was sort of current. Um, I really haven't touched ultimate general gettysburg since the release of ultimate general civil war i I think that that this game um takes everything that that game did and just is a a natural Okay, I apologize. There were uh, technical difficulties with the recording, and so I'm just going to just cut back in at a nice round number um, rather than trying to m- match things to the exact second. So I'm just going to... There's a couple seconds of silence as far as my recording is concerned, but, you know, hey, whatever. There's nothing terribly exciting happening on the screen right now anyway. Um, so before I ran into some technical issues, uh, I haven't picked up Ultimate General Gettysburg since... CW came out. Um, I think Civil War is uh, everything that game was and better, especially with Panic Routes, uh, phenomenal UI modifications um, to just the way that firing cones work and the way that AI behaves. Um, I would love, I, I'm, I'm very excited to um, finish this playthrough, wrap up the Battle of Richmond and jump into the rebalance mod. Um, I imagine that that will end up being almost a whole, not a whole new game, but I mean near enough uh, in that I'm going to have to fundamentally relearn how everything works. Uh, and, and I mentioned before, I'll probably try and do a Confederate campaign um, for that, but we'll see. Uh, okay, so um, we're, the map expands out. And at this point in time, I've, I've decided for myself that the Union Army will not hold the Northern Ridge. Um, and I'm trying to now, uh, say, okay, you know what, even the Southern Ridge is getting expensive to hold, um, predominantly because, uh, they have a wooded covered defensive position to engage me from, and I have a wooded covered defensive position to engage them from. And that is not the kind of thing that I want to be doing. It's not how I trade well. Um, my thought process at this moment is I'd like to take the town and hold the town, um, Speaking of Confederate missions, there's a Confederate mission very early in the campaign called, I think, Newport News. And essentially, you do exactly this. You take the town and hold the town uh, against a Union army, in that instance, trying to cross a river. And you just, you know, turn the river red, essentially. Well, obviously, not that this game models that kind of thing. Um, so uh, I slowly kind of work my forces out of the... Um, the, the Southern Ridge, and I, I, I do that by leading with um, some of the slower things, the slower elements of the army or the weakened brigades. Um, I've, I've merged one of the brigades that was at nearly half strength just because holding the Southern Ridge was expensive. It was hard to do it once they took the Northern Ridge. In my mind, um, whoever controls one ridge functionally controls the other. 
it's only a matter of time uh, before you can kick them out. And so I make the retreat kind of hasty, but uh, I need to get Union troops in this town because I figure the town can be my, my fortress. I, I uh, it doesn't it does kind of work out this way, um, but where where the game determines to be urban terrain versus uh, open terrain is a bit less we'll say obvious than I would have expected. And so the Confederates get into some good cover um, that visually does not look as if it should be good cover to me. Uh, and <clears throat> as a, as a play note, um, when you are setting up your kill zones or where you expect to engage, where you expect the line of engagement to be, hover your mouse over the ground, the terrain where that engagement's going to be and find out what the game thinks that terrain is. is. So uh, it, it's not happening yet, but I'll point it out when it happens in the video. Generally speaking, the Confederates to the uh, west and north of the city are in open terrain or in the water, and I can engage them on favorable terms. Um, when the Confederates in the northeast corner of the city cross that creek and enter what to me looks like open ground, um, they enter what the game considers to be urban terrain because they have crossed over a small fence line and entered um, the, the portions of the map that have been deemed to be part of the city of Gettysburg. And ultimately what that means is that I'm, instead of shooting at um, troops crossing a river or troops in the open while I'm in cover, they're also in cover. And an engagement that should be fairly one-sided and, in, and then you know, two volleys and you're done ends up being a much more protracted kind of thing and requires the allocation of more resources than I had intended it to require. Um, and as a result, it ends up, it ends up going a, a lot longer than it should. Um, additionally, uh, it, it may be who you, as the Union player, to attempt to hold on to the Southern Ridge a little longer um, or to probe with your scouts um, along the very southern edge of the map uh, because there is a huge amount of Confederate artillery uh, on this map. And um, my command just gets shot to pieces, and I, I, I can't... I can't do anything about it. And so as a, as a player, this particular portion of the battle was incredibly frustrating to sit here and I'm, I'm looking at the map and I'm like, how do I get myself out of this position? They're just shelling the crap out of me. And I, I have a 24 pound howitzer unit that ends up getting wiped um, over the course of this particular portion of the engagement. Predominantly, I think because of collateral damage, the battery itself wasn't, I don't think, being directly shot at. It was it was the infantry brigades right in front of it getting shot at, and then some of the spillover was hitting um, hitting the howitzer unit. And so, uh, so yeah, here we go. Um, this, is, this is the push. These three columns right here, or three brigades in column crossing the river. I, I continue to sit here and watch them just eat volleys to the face and the ineffective ones too and i'm over here like they're standing in the open why are the volleys so ineffective what's the deal the game thinks they're in cover um and so i mean the game thinks they're in cover so they are is, is basically all it boils down to um so it's a city fight at that point so that's why they can just absorb that kind of damage and it's no problem um so be be wary of that northern tip of the city if if you're playing the battle and you find yourself in this situation. Uh, additionally, also allocate uh, at least one battery of longer range guns to your uh, force. Now, comma, I say that um, it is a sort of a notorious truism that portions of your army just plain don't show up for this battle. And this 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 happened here. I, I have a I have two dedicated counter battery batteries, two dedicated counter battery units, I guess. Um, in three core, one of whom has three stars. Uh, it's a 20 pound parrot unit and, and another six pound wired unit. And it, it, I could have been utilizing the, um, the dismounted calf scouts as the, I don't know, just to go range and look for their artillery and then just shell the crap out of them. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but it, this particular portion of the battle is going to be frustrating. 
Um, I continued to have to feed units into um, the north and west corner of the city uh, to continue to press off Confederate infantry attempting to cross that river, wherein whatever unit that I put into that spot would just get shelled by, like to my perception, three or more batteries of guns and just blast it into oblivion. And I continued to look at the map and I'm, I'm just thinking like I'm powerless to stop them from doing this. Um, but at the same time, I'm also powerless to, um, to, uh, retreat from the city. I can't go and look for better ground. I must hold the terrain that I've got. Uh, so definitely a damned if I do damned if I don't kind of situation. Um, where if I do, I just, I just, I just admit, accept that I'm going to lose over the course of this battle, six, 700 infantry for no reason from nothing I can do about it. It's, they're just, you know, bye. Um, and, and that feels terrible to be in that position where, where your command is melting in front of you and you've got no, I no idea, you know, you can't give the ground like you normally would in situation and I can't go hunting for their artillery because I lack, I lack the guns to do anything about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, anyway, the point that I'm making is be careful with this part of the battle. Um, I, I use the opportunity that they're so far committed on the left to try and counterattack on my right. Um, and that part actually goes kind of okay. Uh, I, I think that if I'd been a bit more aggressive in trying to press on my right I could theoretically have at least turned their flank here um, and worked my way in the direction of whatever artillery came with uh, the second corps that's attacking me now which I want to say is Ewell um, so Archer and Ewell I think are the two uh, corps commanders that are on the ground at the moment um, oh apparently Hill AP Hill and Archer uh, okay anyway so I've got four or five brigades of infantry on the attack on the right, and then just a a constant, never-ending rotation of units just getting fed into the meat grinder on the far left. Um, but I can't let them in the city. You know, like, that's the thought process I'm sitting on right now, is this is all going on, this is all happening, it sucks, and I hate it. I'm over here like, this is terrible, how do I fix it? But I can't let them into the city. And so I'm thinking, like, you know, just we got to suck it up. we got to find some way to neutralize our guns. Uh, but I'm not sure how to do it. And I've, I've continuously read that like, as you transition into the later, later part of the war, um, the opening phases of your battle are invariably going to be neutralizing Confederate batteries before your infantry can really do anything. And, uh, yep. I mean, <laughs> like, yep. I've, I've read about it. You know, and, and now here I am experiencing it, and that's absolutely my experience, is in this particular battle, the infantry on infantry fighting is almost incidental to what's happening as far as the artillery. The big killer of this battlefield is definitely the artillery. Um, at the same time, I've never really felt like the city was ever in any really serious danger of um, them taking it from me. I've, I've just continued to take losses from... Um, just getting blasted into smithereens by, I don't know, four, five batteries of Confederate artillery. I can't quite eyeball it, but I'm, you know, just, just watching 50 of my men just, you know, for nothing. Uh, now, fortunately, it seems like I can continuously get them to pick one particular unit, and that's the one in the northwest corner. So I feed... 44th infantry I feel bad for that unit I feed 44th infantry to the unit because there are zero star rookies completely green <laughs> and it's it's very cold um, cost benefit calculus that essentially says like I can afford to take the losses there more than I can in my two star infantry units so you know into the meat grinder you go boys my apologies um, and like I said that thought process is terrible I, I, I really don't like thinking about it that way but you know, I'm, I'm, it is what it is. Um, fortunately I'm closing on being done with this portion of the fight. It looks like, um, I, I only say that because I'm looking at my, my timeline and I've made cuts where, where the fighting ends and we're closing up on it. Um, so, you know, there's that. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. There's not a whole lot to tell about this part. This is sort of a fighting retreat the entire part of the first day. It's a significant portion of why I earmarked three core to be in the to be in the day one fight. Day one gets kind of messy uh, because you're continuously falling back um, and then uh, under a pretty relentless assault. So three core handles themselves quite well in, in terms of all the fighting and stuff here. But uh, At the same time, they're just getting shelled into oblivion. So, yay. Yeah, that's great. Love that part. Um, here's sort of that offensive action of mine moving along, and I'm thinking, like, maybe I push across the river, and then pretty quickly I think better of it because I'm like, oh, we've only got 30 minutes in game left before they end this scenario. And I, I think this is one of the ones where once the clock ticks to zero, it pretty immediately clicks, you know, move to the next day. Um, so... So yeah, I, uh, I'm i still moving units around in the town, trying to like find a way to get them out of line of sight. Um, <clears throat> while at the same time kind of keeping an eye across the river and making sure that when the time comes I can zoom forward, pounce, and then blow shit up. But like some of these units have taken 50% casualties and none of that's from musket firing. It's It's, it's all just shell work which is crap um not that you know i have any room to complain because i do the exact same shit to the enemy but still um <laughs> so still i don't like it anyway uh time continues to tick down they never threaten the town i mean not really uh and yeah it's cool we wiped a couple units inflicted some pretty heavy casualties of our own uh i'd imagine in this particular day of fighting we gave as good as we got and that's about it. Okay, um, we go to the camp screen. I um, I go and I take a look at how three corps doing. Replace whatever officers have been have been killed uh, or wounded or whatever. Uh, and then I, I also take some time to um, beef up some of these numbers. Um, I realize that some of these units have picked up a star, so that's cool, I guess. Uh, and then continuing with my policy of um, using rookies until a single additional rookie would cause me to lose a star and and that being the cutoff point for reinforcements um it does result in some of these weird numbers in in, in units but i kind of like it uh or alternatively until i hit um unit cap uh so unit cap is 2500 or something i, I don't mean that i mean like 1500 is as high as i'm willing yeah, sure. to go uh predominantly because it's what i think my armory can support uh, and my and my bankroll. Um, I mean, obviously, if you can get to 2,500 man units without negatively affecting scaling, by all means, give it a shot. Um, Jesus. Some of these guard units are just reamed, wrecked. Um, so after I played it, I watched uh, Southern Compass's battle, and he actually talks about the same thing, where he talks about maybe... Um, letting some of his two-star units become one-star units and vice versa. I think that this is a different thing. Like his unit, his army was much more um, elite than mine. He was very, very, he's he's very good about um, keeping his casualties under control. Um, and, and as a result, his units have been able to scale up pretty significantly without suffering, um, without needing the the massive influx of rookies like my army does um and here i'm running into this issue where i've run out of harper's fairies and evidently they don't make any more uh in this part i guess my understanding is historically this actually did happen where the confederates like knocked out the factory or the arms factory or captured it probably at harper's ferry and as a result um the union couldn't get the harper's ferry yes. model of the 1855 which is fine um insofar as uh i will have 
increasing access to the 61, and soon I'll have access to the Springfield 1863, which is cool. Um, All right, excuse me. All right, so we jump into um, the second day, and this is the attack on... You know, a little round top and and the the far union left. So, um, or not day three, day two. So by this point in time, the union line has overnight. It's um, or maybe this is still later in that day. I forget. Um, yeah, I mean, there's the wheat field that's famous too. So the union is attempting to kind of solidify uh, their their position and. Um, the major engagement or the major portion of this engagement happens where I'm currently moving forces to the south. And that is um, one of the round tops. I, I have to imagine it's little round top. Um, and we're going to get attacked there pretty heavily. So I pull um, my dudes back from that position along the road. I don't know what the hell they're doing up there. That's incredibly... It's just, it's just exposed. It's way the hell too far forward. And um, I think that's actually vaguely historical. Not McClellan being there, obviously. He's not here. And these units, you know, most of them, well, no units existed in the Civil War that are named like mine, except for the 34th Ohio. That existed, but it wasn't a brigade. It was a regiment. Um, I th- ah, man, like I should have done some homework. But this portion of the fighting, I think one brigade did just, or not one brigade, but like one division, he got like orders like, hold here, hold this particular spot. And he's like, no, screw that. I'm going to go. Uh, and that led to just, you know, all kinds of ridiculous holes in the line. And it forced me to, to readjust his position and whatnot. And anyway, so the, 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 the actual battle of Gettysburg is, is fascinating. And not just because it's like, Oh, I'm a big civil war nerd or whatever. Like, it's a fascinating example of perfect execution, set piece, um, Napoleonic style, multiple core maneuver in the same manner as as uh, the Napoleonic era is famous for. And, and, and obviously this war is, I think, um, famous and terrible for um, its, its general insistence of continuing to utilize Napoleonic maneuver and tactics in an era where the firearms made that increasingly, like, untenable. Um, and it's where you see, you know, I mean, you, you see just insane butcher's bills for some of these battles. And it's not that World War One is much better um, or um, the uh, German wars of unification in this era. Uh, I'm starting to sort of branch out um, of my reading about military history or military theory uh, to include other conflicts in this general area to see like how unique or how different um, the American war for or the American Civil War was compared to uh, chronologically similar engagements uh, and the the most immediately like to comes to mind is the um, I want to say it's the Schleswig War this is Denmark and Prussia um, and then th- th- that happens I think next next year as far as the game's concerned uh, but it you know limited research I've done and there's this European miniseries um, about it that I hear is really great uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to watch it uh, stream it download DVDs whatever um, but you know, anyway, it looks great. I want to check it out. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm starting to get the impression based on my research that, um, the problems in this particular conflict in terms of maneuver and utilization of men and everything else and tactics and so forth were not unique as much as I was, I was initially under the impression to the war now absolutely in the early stages you definitely had the issue of um two completely green armies fighting and that's that's where you get the um you get the just the the cra- oh, on screen sorry uh i occupy defense and train and hold it the end uh <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't, I don't want to like oversimplify how this particular portion of the battle goes. Um, but, you know, pro tip, uh, Little Round Top got held by one understrength regiment with like no, no logistical support and I think a handful of sharpshooters. And it got down to the point where uh, Josh Chamberlain's like, screw it, we got no bullets, but they don't know that. Let's get, <laughs> let's get bayonets and go. So like this whole thing gets held by nothing. Uh, so if you properly support this position, it's pretty much untakeable. Okay, uh, GG. Um, I also finally have a unit of 20-pound uh, parrots that are able to just continuously over the course of the battle um, plaster uh, Alexander's battery, which came into this fight at 250. Um, and I'm like, okay, he's got three stars, and then there's the one that, that's just below it whose name I unfortunately can't read, and they're a one-star battery. They've got 320-some-odd guys. It's a one-star battery. I'm less concerned about that right now than I am knocking out the three-star. So I kill the three-star, and then obviously I put the parrot on the one-star unit. And um, I'll tell you, like, parrots are really starting to grow on me. <laughs> like, I know early in the campaign I was kind of like, meh, parrots don't kill anything. They're not that big a deal. Who cares? Uh, but now I'm starting to see, like, oh, parrots are useful for counter-battery. Uh, and then I can use, I don't know, 24-pound howitzers or James guns or, or something for, for, you know, the, the counter-infantry work. Um, and in, in that regard, uh, the one unit of 24-pound howitzers that's along with the infantry and McClellan holding the the, uh, the ridge line here is, is just doing, you know, insane work. We get uh, a unit of uh, brown-armed skirmish snipers, and they're going to come in and see if they can't get some pot shots off on uh, the artillery unit as well to attempt to defang as much as possible um, Union artillery. I am aware that eventually um, fighting occurs to the north of the map, and so to that regard, I am not um, uh, over-pulling resources from further north in the map, pr predominantly because I also think that the three brigades that are there can probably hold this thing, you know, forever, as long as I can keep their artillery... Uh, yeah, as long as I can keep their artillery engaged or from doing too much damage, my thought process is those dudes can hold that, that hilltop pretty much forever. So, um, yeah, anyway, so, um, trying to read about, uh, the union army and the Confederate army, kind of how they, they worked as armies out, outside of this game, obviously the, the real event, uh, and I and I, I keep on reading like it's the it's the it's the opinion of um, oh man I can't think of his name right now John Keegan uh, I'm a huge fan of his work I think that his 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 writings about military here history and and battlefield psychology are some of the best uh, and he's a professor at Sandhurst um, but he's he's published. And I, I've continued to sing the praises to anybody who will listen uh, of his history of the First World War in particular. It's, it's, and I think I've talked about this in another, another video where he takes what I thought to be kind of a boring war and makes it fascinating. Um, and uh, he does that with the Civil War as well. And I, I really should read his World War II book um, at some juncture, but it's one of those, I'll get to it when I get to it. And anyway, he, he, he makes the claim that um, by the end of the war, absolutely in the beginning, the, it's, it's essentially just a bunch of militiamen playing at war and not really having any idea what they're doing. Um, that's his assertion, and it's one that I would generally agree with. You take a look at the atrocious performances of both armies at, um, at uh, First Manassas, and, and you know, then you compare it with the performance of the armies at... Uh, well, at Gettysburg or the Mule Shoe or the Wilderness Campaign, and you've got just vastly different um, tempos, vastly different perceptions of what initiative looks like, vastly different, uh, you know, conceptualizations around maneuver, um, all of that. And it's 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 his assertion that by the end of the war, um, the Union Army, at least, is the equal of any other, um, you know, industrialized power in in the world is is the equal in in field skill um in in troop utilization in battlefield acumen um general knowledge of its soldiers etc of, of any other you know european power and i don't think that he makes in in the book uh, a major connection to 
um, the German wars of unification that are happening in this period, uh, or uh, even is this around the time that Garibaldi is is helping Italy become Italy? I think this is around the same time. Um, maybe it's a little later than this. I don't know. I'll have to look it up. I'll, I'll look it up. Um, actually, let me look it up right now. This is the power of the cell phone. I can record this and Google things at the same time. Uh, Italian of independence? Unification. There you go. Okay, so it's earlier. It's it, This has already happened. Um... Italian unification. Yeah, this is the by, by now this has already happened and Italy's already a thing. So I guess we don't I don't I'll have to take a look at kind of how that goes. Uh, on the screen at this point in time I'm I'm looking at how many how many forces they've given me. They've basically given me the entirety of I Corps and the better part of Two Corps. And I like when I'm playing this back is this is over the weekend. I'm playing this and I'm like what the hell? <laughs> like this is this is they, I don't need this much. This is far more than I need. So now I'm kind of sitting here and I'm like well we may as well take the entire map. <laughs> so I, like I've got, I've got two hours of in-game time, and I've got, like, you look at that blue bar. I've got way more people uh, than they do, so why not, right? Um. Yeah. Anyway, so I, I would. Uh, this, this is, I guess, every one of these videos, I have a discussion about what's happening on the map and then I have some me some like it, it's almost a podcast at this point just some random random <laughs> random ramblings about uh all kinds of, like I almost I almost feel like the old guy who was like back in 1923 you know <laughs> like, I just start going off about basically whatever I've been reading this week is essentially what it boils down to um uh anyway point I'm trying to get at is I had had a perception that um, this was essentially two, two a war of two factions of amateurs playing at playing at tin soldier with each other, and um, I think that that perception is really inaccurate, uh, and that's on me to kind of own that. Uh, that that perhaps that level of amateur excitement and enthusiasm of like, oh, we're going to play soldier for a weekend um, may have been and would almost certainly be an accurate assessment of both the Confederate and Union Army um, in and around the campaign surrounding uh, First Manassas. And I'd argue probably through Shiloh, uh, probably through the Shiloh campaign, you still had this perception that um, I still had this perception that, you know, one good solid battle would 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 settle the whole war uh and and then i i think there's this slowly but surely it becomes a, a dawning realization that it's not going to be that um somewhere in between shiloh and antietam uh And then, you know, when Ulysses Grant becomes the commander, the major general or lieutenant general, I think, of, of essentially the high commander of the Army of the Potomac, you know, it's, it's a very fatalistic kind of, we're just going to grind them down um, thought process. And uh my my reading hasn't taken me to that part of the war yet, Cold Mountain or the Wilderness Campaign or anything like that, the Siege of uh, Richmond. But uh, the media presentation, State of Jones, for example, or um, some of the things I've I've seen as far as photographs of this era, it of, of that particular era towards the end of the Civil War, it, it almost looks like World War One. Like it almost looks not that far off at all from. You know, you could take Richmond and, and inter, interpose it with uh, the Somme, and it wouldn't be a terribly far off um, analogy. Just the the preponderance of artillery and the immediacy of entrench work, entrenching work that's done, and uh, all of that. Uh, I have this this suspicion um, that 
you get that sort of it's, it, that's the effect of industrialization on warfare, uh, especially given that um, maneuver warfare, as you saw at Second Bull Run, for example, becomes increasingly difficult. Uh, where troops in the open are almost immediately coming under artillery fire and increasingly effective artillery fire, it, the the natural and immediate tendency it, from just a from just a force preservation perspective is to entrench at nearly every opportunity, and then from there it's a hop, skip, and a jump, and you've got you're no longer fighting the Napoleonic War; you're fighting the early stages of the um, First World War you know, all over again. Or not, not all over again, but before it's actually happened. Um, and it's interesting just kind of to watch, uh, I, w- I would almost say like three distinct phases of military thought or, or military reality in the course of the American War, civil, uh, American Civil War. I keep on coming close to almost saying the American War for Independence. Uh, and, and I think a, a strong portion of that is is that uh, a lot of Confederates, I mean, think about this. We're, we're only like 80 years removed from the War for Independence at this point in time. So um, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, people here fighting the actual Civil War, you know, their grandfather or something was, grandfather or great-grandfather was, was at, you know, Yorktown or or uh, the Siege of Boston, or whatever. And so there, yes, there's immigrants and yeah, all that kind of stuff, sure, okay. But it wouldn't surprise me if if the thought process amongst a lot of these folks was, was they're looking at, especially the guys in the gray uniform, obviously, um, they're, they're like, yeah, we're just fighting a second version of the war for independence. Like our our shelling of Fort Sumter is the same thing as chucking tea into the, into the Chesapeake. Um, I, I don't. I don't know. I would imagine that's the case. I don't. I can't prove it, obviously. But um, yeah, military. I don't want to say theory, but m- the concepts of maneuver evolve very rapidly as an indirect result, or no, actually, I would say a direct result of uh, industrialization. Um, and you see a lot of it born out of necessity and experience and everything else in in this con in this conflict. Um, you, you very early on, the generals were obsessed with being the next Napoleon and fighting the, the next Waterloo. Uh, and like it's that's just not not at all how anything in this war went. Um, you certainly had set piece battles. You absolutely had set piece battles, but it, I mean, you just you didn't have them having the same impact. Um, and it wasn't really until you had the my perception anyway, it wasn't really until you had the economic warfare aspects come into play and really start to seriously impact the home front that things achieved a decisive turn. Because, I don't know, like, these had these battles and, like, none of them were really, like, conclusive victories one way or the other. There were some absolutely conclusive Confederate victories and there were a handful of conclusive Union victories and so forth. But, both armies seemed pretty yeah. intent on trying to destroy the army of the opposing faction um, in a very Klaus Witzian kind of read on the overall war. Like, hey, if we knock the army of the Potomac out of the equation, you know, that's it. Uh, we'll be able to force a, um, a, a political solution. Uh, and that's a, that's like, it, it's, it's a, a not unreasonable, I think, assessment of the situation. There, there's certainly no possibility whatsoever that, um, 
the Confederacy would be able to conquer the Union. And I don't think that was ever seriously considered. That was never like meaningfully intended to be the goal of the the Civil War from the perspective of a of Confederate high command. They never thought like, yep, we're going to go ahead and march on New York. Like, it's just not going to happen. There, there were certainly, I think, t- intentions to threaten D.C. But everything that I've read indicates that it was all with the intention of forcing the Union to come to the table and allow for a negotiated conclusion to hostilities. Which, of course, is why I sometimes feel like the Confederate campaign gets silly towards the end of the campaign as the the makers of this game, Game Lab, are forced to continuously push themselves further and further off the rails of history as the um, Confederate campaign uh, (laughs) continues to not fail, right? Like, so... I think after after Gettysburg, the Confederates never really undertake anything major offense major offensive maneuvers ever again. And um, you have to deal with from the game design perspective. If we're winning the Battle of Gettysburg, what the hell does that look like? You know, like I I think that we could we could win the Battle of Shiloh. Um, as the Confederate player, and the war would still continue moving in most of the same direction. And you could win um, Fredericksburg because they did historically. And you can win, you know, second bull run because they did historically. And you can win first bull run because they did historically. And all that's fine because none of that really changes the, the course of the war. But, you know, when you start winning battles that were crucial to the lifeblood of the war effort, that historically you lost and forced you onto a defensive back foot from a game design perspective. What the hell do they do? How do they go back and say like, yep, you completely destroyed the union army in and around Gettysburg, but instead of marching on Washington and forcing a political surrender, now you're fighting a cold Harbor. <laughs> like, I, What do you do? I, I completely respect that. They don't really have a good answer to that question. Um, this is just, there's not a good answer to that question. It's are you are you putting us in a series of scenarios reminiscent of actual civil war battles and asking us if we can do better? Okay, that's a game. Um, are you giving us total war style control over the entirety of our economy and the disposition of our troops and then letting us just fight the war out? Okay, that's another game. Um, and one of the things I think that's fantastic about this game is that it it, it takes these scenarios closely based on reality, but then it injects um you know your decisions into it but unfortunately to keep the game interesting they kind of have to throw real world um economics out of the equation i mean we've killed by this point in time we have to have killed uh killed captured or wounded in excess of what five hundred thousand um Confederate men at arms, presumably. I mean, close to that figure. Um, and y- you take a look at the, you know, sustainable population rates. The Confederacy never had more than, oh, over the course of four or five years of warfare, they never had. Was it? Eh, it was just four. They never had, you know, over a million men in uniform. They had approximately nine hundred thousand over the course of the entire time. Some folks got wounded and then got replaced. So at any one point in time, they may have had, what, 400,000 maybe? And with that, they have to defend the entirety of the border. So how much of that can, can realistically be allocated to the um, to the Northern Virginia corridor the, the, between Richmond and Washington? Uh. It, Taking aside a discussion about economics for a moment. In-game, uh, we're defending Culp's Hill. Um, I would be fine to just sit there and cover and blast away, but I got bored. <laughs> so I uh, I grabbed this collection of uh, random brigades. It's like five of them. And um, began kind of a push to try and conquer... Um, 
this other side of the river uh, so that I could theoretically get an eyeball on their artillery and then provide some counter battery because I, I have I have one or two units of 20 pound parrots here and I want to use them. However, I've also got um, two of my brigades are now exhausted and I want to rest up one and I want to let them, you know, get comfortable. Uh, so yeah, Culp's Hill is pretty easy to hold. This is, I, there's, I don't know. There's, there's no universe that I can think of unless you're already losing the battle elsewhere where this is ever meaningfully threatened by the Confederate army. Um, this terrain's just so good for defense. Um, so yeah, uh, overall battle still going great. Day one was a rough situation. Day two, uh, with the fighting around little round top went phenomenally. Um, this is either, this is the tail end of day two is, is going great here as well. Uh, the Confederate army is obliged to throw itself face first into a union army on, um, excellent defensive terrain. And, uh, there's, there's not like a really great way for them to, <clears throat> to do, you know, that. Um, so we get third guards and 31st infantry in a position where they, from an elevated wooded position, can fire on Confederate infantry trying to cross a river. Uh, and I know there's an artillery battery over there too, and I want to get guns on that as well. I don't manage it um, because there's a third brigade of infantry here. I don't realize is here. Um, the charge of Jones and Hayes into third guards could be quite concerning however uh the local presence uh, the local superiority of union artillery um really kind of knocks the sails or knocks the wind out of the sails of uh the confederate attack here pretty healthily i mean they they jones um is shaken and hayes uh successfully connects makes contact but is pretty rapidly thrown back by uh, three guards and 31 rifles. Uh, 27th on the far right is um, engaged by a large unit of cavalry that I didn't know was here. Um, I didn't know that there was going to be Confederate cavalry at all, so I was a bit shocked when that happened. Um... And then, and then even more so when a second one showed up. But um, I, I, like, I, I don't think, especially in this particular period of military history, there should ever be a situation where rested, stable, formed heavy infantry with firearms and what amounts to pikes should, should ever be meaningfully threatened by um, unarmored, uh, it looks like sword and pistol cavalry. It's three units of traditional cavalry um, because you, you don't see that carbine crossing across the horse head. So this is all just melee cav. So they've got 1,500-ish melee cav in woods trying to threaten um, formed infantry in good order. There's just no no universe where that happens. There's none. It's not possible. Uh, and that's because, I mean, you know, any version of a period appropriate musket with a bayonet is functionally also a spear. I mean, these guns are what, five and a half, six feet long? I mean, they're, they're not six feet, but, but like five and a half is not completely inaccurate to think of. So, yeah, the, the army there throws them off, but it, it, it successfully stalls um, my intentions of launching any kind of uh, offensive counter thrust on their artillery. We move into the camp section. I clean the army up again. Uh, at this point in time, I'm tired and kind of bored um, of like being whiny about numbers. So I just replace officers and just leave the casualties to be what they're going to be um, with the thought process that I'll fix it before Chickamauga. Uh, yeah. So we're heading into, I think, arguably the f most famous portion of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, and this is Pickett's Charge. Now, 
um, you know, with like hindsight, 2020 hindsight and everything, we like to think like it's really stupid. Well, sorry, never mind. Um, before Pickett's charge, there is a second attempt at an attack on Culp's Hill, which is, if anything, if it's possible, even less, um, even more ill-advised <laughs> than the first one, uh, because that one had at least the cover of darkness. Uh, this one's in broad daylight. However, um, somehow, because of the, the magic of phased battlefields, um, we no longer occupy our forward positions as we did. Uh, we are now behind earthworks in the woods like idiots. Uh, so this part of the engagement, I try and continue to find the Confederate flank. Um, when it's apparent that they're dug in on their flank, I'm like, oh, I don't want to mess with that. And I pull my, my flanker skirmishers back in. I should, in retrospect, have said, oh, there's only 338 of them, closed ranks of the skirmishers, and charged with uh, 40 second infantry and whoever else is across that river um because getting on the opposite side of this confederate position would have been disastrous for them in the instance uh i mean it's still disastrous for them <laughs> there's, again there's not really any universe where this attack ever looks like it's going to be successful um they uh they're 500 man brigades charging um Units three times there's three times their size defending terrain behind earthworks and forests. It's just not it's just not possible. Uh, so this is another portion of the, of the engagement where I'm kind of not ever seriously engaged. I, I gotta say I'm a little like flummoxed. I guess is the best way to describe this portion of the fight. Uh, really everything past the first day, where I was, you know, very frustrated by by feeling trapped. Um, And I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated here because these none of these offensives from the Confederate Army ever have even a, you know, a snowball's chance in hell of, of being successful. You're sending, you know, I don't know, 12,000 men, maybe. Maybe. Not even that many. You're sending, you know, 7,000 men against 13 or 14,000 guys dug in 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 an uphill attack in broad daylight with artillery support and they're in heavy defensive terrain come on man no one would do that and unless they were truly desperate nobody would do that it's just silly and that's kind of what i get frustrated by is we talk about how the battle of gettysburg like if you had 2020 hindsight the i think the confederate army should have just left after um so and so corps commander failed to secure that like so in the historical event after so and so corps commander fails to secure uh the high ground and thereby guaranteeing the ability for their artillery to sight you know long ways along the union line they should have said like okay too bad so sad um disengage pull back and then maneuver around the Union Army or meet them at, at ground of their choosing. And again, this is another point that the film makes. Um, I forget the name of the general in particular. I want to say Longstreet, but don't quote me on that. Um, he's, he's, you know, suggesting all of that to, to General Lee. He's like, look, you know, like they have the high ground. It sucks, but they do. Let's go fight them somewhere else. And Lee in the movie, he's all like, but the boys have fought really hard and I don't want to like disheartened them. Come on, dude. Lee's better than that. Like this, that like this movie, that movie gets a lot of crap for being, um, you know, like a, a Southern apologist film. And, and that's a different discussion. I'm not going to get into as far as this, this particular channel, but like, I think he was smarter than that. I think he was more wise than that. Lee, in his memoirs, written uh, like he 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 wrote, he collected his thoughts and it's not a journal, but he collected his thoughts um, on the day of. And like to his credit, he writes everything we endeavored to do that day, given the data we had to work with at the time, seemed to be to us practicable. And he uses that word again, and 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 the word practicable was the same word that he used to. 
uh, order that, and I'm, I just don't remember the guy's name, um, but it was Jackson's replacement, I think. And I talked about this in my uh, my Chancellorsville video as well. Losing losing Jackson, I think, was critical because Jackson would have understood practicable means do it, uh, and he would have taken those that ridge. He would have done whatever he had to take that ridge, and um, the the failure to do so on day one, they thought it was you know unfortunate, but a thing we can work around, and. A lot of, I think a lot of the thought process to that is because Lee's blind. Uh, and Stewart, Jeb Stewart's off off on some multi-week long ride around the Confederate Army, basically wasting his time. He collects some supply wagons and raids some stuff and does, does you know, does cav shit, right? Okay, fine, does cav shit. But I think he's basically wasting his time because in this at this point in time, his big role is to be the eyes and ears of the Confederate Army. And he's blind. I don't. I don't remember how how good the intel was that Lee had, but I don't know how much he knew about the army ahead of them. I know that they were aware that Meade had just taken command of the army, and they expected that Meade would, you know, they, they, I guess they knew Meade. Like they'd gone to school together. This is the sad thing about this war is that most of these guys had been in college together, so they were all like, "Oh, Meade would be a pretty cool-headed kind of dude." So, okay, like I guess they figured Meade would read the battle a little differently than this. But I mean, after Hooker's, um, Joseph Hooker's um, misread uh, of the Chancellorsville situation, I'm sure the Confederate Army was like, we got this. And I can respect that. I can respect how humans would be kind of like, yep, we got this. And none of them have the sort of omniscient map view that we, the players, have in this game. None of them had the benefit of 2020 hindsight like we do in the moment or in, now 150 some odd years later. That's all true. I respect that. I absolutely do. I still think given the data you had to work with on the ground, that should have been enough for even Lee to be like, mm, maybe next time. Um, and that's, that's a big, that's a big statement. I think, you know, because a lot of folks are kind of like, yeah, I know he, he could have won that battle. Um, I don't think so. Looking at the map, looking at the, the terrain, looking at who was where, I, I think that there's no way. Um, uh, unless you do it on day one and you seize that initiative, I don't think there's any way you win that battle. Uh, you know, I don't know. I think that uh, the forces that were attempting to take Little Round Top were... Um, in a in a worse off position to do so because of the first day of fighting, than if they'd um, you know done that. And and I think that if you're Lee, you've you've just got to continuously be asking yourself, can we afford these losses? And uh, I you know I don't know I don't know I, I wasn't there I'm not you know I'm not in the army in this era I don't know how much we think about that kind of thing. Um, rates of rates of casualties and can you afford that kind of attrition? Like one of the things that I keep reading about in terms of uh, U.S. Grant is that he was one of the few commanders willing to trade at at the kind of rates that he did. He was one of the only commanders who would who would look at wilder, the wilderness battle and be like, "Yep, that was a win." Um, and uh, that that. W- that was almost in and of itself revolutionary by that alone. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how I got here. <laughs> I apologize. I think a lot of this video has been talking about the evolution of, um, of the way a war got fought in, in terms of not only the um, perception where I talk about how they wanted to just have one big Waterloo and call it a day, uh, like just bingo bango we're time we're home by Christmas but you hear that shit all the time about World War One movies too like everyone thought like or movies books and everything they're like yeah we're gonna be home by Christmas and 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 there was this perception that we were gonna like dig some trenches in France and play in the woods for a bit and fire off some rounds at each other and that'd be that like I don't understand it like it in it, 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 it to like to my mindset that's still an incredibly naive way to view war even in the era even if you look at that the primary sources of the era would be like okay yeah sure like napoleon's 
victories all were accomplished by one larger battle. You know, you look at Jenna Auerstadt or you look at, um, oh, I don't know, off the top of my head, I can't think of all of his big victories in the early parts of his, his efforts, but um, he had some of these large set-piece battles that basically knocked entire countries out of the war. Okay, sure. That was 1815. And the thing that you had to take, or 18, no, 18, like, 05 at this point, 1809, you know, that kind of thing. Nations industrialized in the course of the of the Napoleonic Wars. Like, you, you saw interchangeable parts in, in the, the Charleville and the Brown Bass Muskets and then whatever the the Prussians and Austrians were using. Um, you, 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 the mass mobilizations, levy and mass was a new concept in 18, you know, 07 or whatever. Um, <clears throat> all of this stuff. And, and the ultimate way that these countries ended up getting, getting Napoleon was in a multi-year war that involves all the powers working together against France and, and its allies in, in Poland, Spain, Italy, whatever. Um, multi-year campaign that ultimately was successful by way of a i mean general winner okay fine but but a simply out fighting them at a certain juncture and then b outlasting them so you've got like the the only big major significant war that is is in this period like significant major multi multi multi-year long conflict is essentially a war of economic attrition essentially like that's that's gross 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 oversimplification Okay, fine. But um, a lot of it boils down to, you know, eventually Napoleon starts taking these irreplaceable losses, just not in terms of manpower, although certainly that, and having to like dig deeper and dig deeper into the the force pool that he conscripts from. Um, But he also starts to lose more and more veterans from the early, the longer uh, living veterans. You know, the guys who are with him in Egypt, the guys who are with him in the first wars against Austria, the guys, um, you know, who were with him uh, in in the invasion of Spain. And to win that war, they had to threaten the French Empire from like so many different sides just to wear it down. And you had this constant rate of slow trickle attrition in in, in, in Spain, especially, and, and then against Wellington. And as much as Wellington was important and, and the efforts of the British Army plus the Portuguese and then eventually the Spanish, um, that's all true. But also the resistance elements that just continuously one guy here, one guy there pulled all that stuff off the line and forced France to continuously deploy dragoons in large number to the entirety of the Spanish countryside, every battalion or sorry, squadron of dragoons guarding the mail or some shit in Spain is a battalion, not going with the army to go fight at Borodino. And, you know, does that add up? Yeah, absolutely. How many, how many battalions pulled off the line or squadrons or batteries pulled off the line to go hold down territory that's currently not really happy with their new flag. When's the tipping point? When's one battalion too many? And you take a look at Borodino, like, you know, or the, or the general campaign in Russia. What's one more, what, 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 what critical mass? One more battalion, two more battalions, another division, another corps would have been enough for Napoleon to tip that thing and take take moscow before the winter comes in and would that have been enough would taking moscow be enough there's this perception that if we can march on richmond we can end the war for the civil war and that's probably accurate actually like it genuinely i think that if the union army had been able to get to get to get to and take richmond i think it's probably accurate that that would have ended the war um which is you know Interesting because there was the seven days battles where the Union Army landed near Richmond and seriously threatened it. And if they'd prosecuted that campaign better, if they'd had a better army, by which I mean more experience, by which I mean, you know, more initiative, by which I mean just just more competent. Um, one wonders what would have happened, you know, at in, in those battles. And 
that's when I keep on saying like there's this perception that the war is going to be quick. I just don't. I just. I just don't see it. I don't see how any war is ever as quick as is ever. It's it's never as quick as everyone thinks it's going to be. That's what I'm. That's what I think is. Is like the only war that I can think of that was quick was the first Gulf War, off the top of my head. That was like super quick like that. I mean, there's the Seven Days War, which is probably also pretty quick. You know, <laughs> like a week. Um, but like we were expecting the the war in the Gulf to be this big, long, drawn out thing, and then that ended up being pretty quick because we over prepared to shit and back for it. Um, which is what you need to do, by the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I read about um, First Manassas and just how how the army, like, lacked the, like, this the soldiers lacked the basic soldiering competency required to prosecute that kind of a campaign. They were tired too early. They um, were uncomfortable in the heat and they just didn't have the physical endurance to keep fighting when they were exhausted or dehydrated or that kind of thing. They didn't have... Um, the knowledge in terms of speed of march they they maneuvered clumsily um brigades that had to go one way were in front of brigades that had to go another way holding up the road um you know just the the those little logistical things in terms of how an army maneuvers they think they marching in a straight line pretty on a, on a parade ground and holding your rifle and all the steps involved with with loading and firing a musket in this era is like 13 steps it's ridiculous all of that, I'm sure you can drill all of those things into the individual soldiers' head. Absolutely. No question about it. You could have done that in the time you had to play with before the Battle of Manassas. Okay, fine. Or before the Seven Days campaign. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. But the things that you need to figure out on a logistical level, marching an entire brigade, marching an entire division, organizing the maneuvers of multiple corps so that two different corps arrive on the same battlefield on the same date, um, despite taking wildly disparate ways to get there. That's the kind of thing. Those sorts of pieces of expertise, you can't really train, I don't think. You can run through tables, you can run through um, classroom stuff, but you know, like if the Seven Days campaign had had a little longer to get ready or been undertaken a bit later in the war, we would, you would likely have had a different, different outcome. And this comes back to my central thesis that the union army, and, and to be quite frank, I would also argue the Confederate army, but I, I would say that both armies were the equal in terms of capability, if not uh, capacity. And I'll get to that in just a second of any of their peers, um, just because of experience, you know, that, that they, they, had figured out what worked. They knew how to march. They knew how to organize and maneuver multiple columns together to strike at the right time, all that kind of stuff that they'd figured those things out. Now, where the capacity difference might occur, which capability means the ability, the, the um, skill to pull a certain thing off and cap capacity is the industrial ability to support that kind of thing. This, how I'm using the terms here. So the Union Army was likely the equal in capability and capacity to any other European power. They had the industrial might to create enough muskets to keep up and clothe and medical supply, medically supply and house and, you know, all that shit. Um, and I, I think that the economic and industrial realities meant that the Confederacy might have had the capability that was equal to if like a lot of folks are like, oh, they're better. Uh, and okay, fine, sure. Let's take that out of the equation altogether. I, I'm not going to be one of those folks who's like, yep, the Confederate Army was definitely better. It was, I think, inarguably better led early on in the war, but that changed over time. Um, where that cake, cake, Sorry, I've been talking for a while. Where that capability starts to fall through is in their industry's ability to support that capacity. Make it possible. Can firearms uh, producers in the South keep up with demand for uh, rifles and muskets? Can cannon makers keep up? Can um, horse stables um continue breeding horses at a fast enough rate and then training and then shoeing them and so forth and so on 
at a fast enough rate to keep up with whatever losses are occurring on the field of battle? I, I don't think so. I mean, you look at it on paper and it's just, there's just no way in the number of miles of uh, railroad or the number of factories or the population or uh, the number of immigrants or arable land or the amount of farming being done or the amount of, you know, all of that stuff. Every day that the Union fought was a day that they got better and stronger than their Confederate opponent, even if no actual fighting occurred. And this is a fact that that I think everyone was aware of. Lee was not certainly, like, was never taken by surprise by this fact. I think everyone was aware of these realities. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, that's, here we go um, to the most famous uh, portion of this battle and certainly the most foolhardy. Um, I think even without 2020 hindsight, there's absolutely no reason at all, at all, um, to have undertaken this particular offensive, even if you accomplish your objective to what end, even, even if the Confederate or sorry, even if the union middle is lightly defended and you strike a death blow to the middle, you have just essentially created for yourself a salient to be pinched off. If you assume the union is strong at little round top and you assume accurately, the union is strong at Culp's Hill striking and taking the terrain in between Round Top and Colts Hill does you fucking nothing. You, you get to kill a couple of guys in blue. Okay. Taking aside completely that to get to the Union middle, you have to march across an open field without cover. Meh. Okay, not easy. That you, you have to concentrate all of your guns into a massive and very impressive cannonade and, you know, try and see if you can't pin Union gunners. Okay, all of that's true. Let's say all of it goes down. Let's say you do all of it. Everything goes exactly right as it needs to. All of your cannons have God mode cheats on and they hit whatever they shoot at. And you have bullets forever. And none of those things are considered. And you have to worry about, you know, how many how many uh, shells you have and how much powder and how much cordite and how much whatever. No, 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 no. Assuming all of that didn't matter. And you could you could gun them forever. I genuinely I've looked at the map, I've read the rationale for the attack. I even with twenty twenty, even with you know perfect without perfect hindsight, if you're just there on the day of, there is simply no reason, none, for Pickett's division to be committed to this attack. None, none whatsoever. You've lost on day one. You've lost on day two. Suck it up. Retreat and fight somewhere else. Hold defensive terrain between the Union Army and Washington. Pick your spot. A river crossing, uphill somewhere. I don't care. Now, like, I'm from the North, and I'm, I've never really been a big Confederate apologist, and I don't think that there was whatever. That's not really relevant to this discussion. There's just no reason to do this. There's none. And, and it's it's... You know, you're just putting yourself in the middle of two highly defended wooded hills around the town of Gettysburg. And all you're going to do is just get shot to shit by all the cannon on those hills. To, to, to do what? To control a road and some farms? Okay, no one cares. The whole objective of this invasion to the north was for the Confederate Army to fight another another defensive battle somewhere and just smash the shit out of the Union who, f who had, from political reality, who had to engage. They couldn't disengage and maneuver. They, they, all of the political onus was on the Union here. The, the political objective of the invasion of Pennsylvania was sound. The intention, Lee's mission was sound. All of it makes sense. It tracks, it's logical, it all works. If it had gone even mostly to plan, I think their read on um, union politics in the era was accurate. 
was was accurate. Everything that I've read about this particular portion right up until this battle, right up until this battle and the simultaneously the simultaneous victory at Vicksburg, everything that I've read, especially after the embarrassing defeat at Chancellorsville, suggests that an increasingly large portion of the electorate was thinking, like, why? Why do we fight this out? You know, why don't we we take a look at a negotiated solution? Why don't we take a look at um, coming to the table? And with Lincoln up for re-election, you know, coming up on the end here, coming up on uh, a series of disastrous defeats. You've got Fredericksburg, which was terrible. Antietam, terrible. Second Manassas, terrible. Chancellorsville, terrible. From the perspective on the ground at the time, the invasion of the North makes sense. And and engaging at Gettysburg initially makes sense. But there's a point where you gotta cut your losses. And and I genuinely think it's last night. I think it's last night you try at the flanks, it doesn't work. Okay, move on. Pull back. And I don't know. That's that's just me. Um reading reading, you know, about the battle and everything else. I think you, you you don't need Lee or you don't need um, Stewart, Jeb Stewart to tell you these things that the union is dug in around this terrain. You could pull back. You could leave, you could leave a core um, and engage as a rear guard. Um, the union cavalry who you just know would start harrying, napping at your nipping at your heels. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're going to come out and you need to go ahead, remind them, that's a, that's a mistake, but I don't know. I, there's just no no reason I can think of why why this attack ever had to happen. Um. Yeah, and yeah, like this is someone who doesn't think that the Civil War really should have happened. Really, I don't think that that. Uh, I, I respect the causes. I respect all the history. I respect the culture. I respect all those things. Um, you know, the, the people who, who look at the era and, and think whatever they think about it, all of that stuff is fine. I have been to the battlefields. I've, I've, I respect and understand all of the pride that goes into fighting, you know, kind of a losing fight. And I genuinely do think that the uh, military, uh, the military and political objectives of the of the invasion in Pennsylvania, were timed perfectly. It was the right time to do it. Sitting there and waiting, and because the alternative was to sort of take a passive stance, right, and just kind of continue allowing the Union to come fight in your territory. But the issue with that is that even though you're winning, you're winning on. Confederate soil and Union armies are again and again and again and again um, violating Confederate soil and living off of Confederate soil and raiding Confederate towns and supply stores and you know all those kind of things and denying you several square miles of arable land and factories and things that could contribute to your GDP and resources and whatnot at a time when every single ounce of efficiency that could be wrung out of your GDP is vital. So yeah, fight on the fight on Northern soil for the first time, make the Northerners feel like feel what it's like to be at war. Deny them a factory or two, deny them some cornfields. Absolutely. This makes perfect sense. I absolutely think the objectives of the Northern invasion made perfect sense. I just think at this point in time, you should have cut your losses, preserved your army, and fought another day. But that's me getting way off topic. Um, In-game, nothing terribly exciting. I, at this point in time, they're beaten. Um, this is a decent attack on the middle, but it's 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 delivered in such a like a half-hearted manner. And it's it's not intelligently prosecuted, and uh, they don't have enough stuff to guard their flanks. So a skirmisher swarm and a cav unit pretty rapidly start removing their artillery from the equation. And at that point in time, the the, the wind has been pulled out of their sails. 
so again, this is a battle that has a chance to be really exciting. And when you play it um, on the uh, when you play it on the um, uh, I think it's the historical battle mode, right? Where you you, you just play and the AI um, gives you an army. And you're not worried about the campaign. It's really exciting. <laughs> it's really exciting because uh, it, it's, it's well balanced at that point and you haven't had the chance to build this perfect war fighting machine so you're dealing with what the game makers think is a pretty close approximation of the uh, forces that were actually there and, and it's a lot more I think touch and go but here you've got the battles where the Union Army is really coming in high off of uh, the heels of Chancellorsville, where in my version of the game, the Union Army did great. And uh, we saw the Uni the Confederate Army strength at uh, Chancellorsville was just shy of 75,000, and their strength here is uh, just shy of like 65,000. Like, that's huge. That's gigantic. Um, and sp spoiler alert, they're, they're knocked down a whole nother peg after this fight and it's 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 just very very hard um for for them to put up a meaningful fight after the um the kind of insane casualties they took um in day one and uh yeah so on the battlefield map or whatever i'm i'm uh, eyeballing a counterattack here. I don't have a particular need to do so just yet because I do actually want this to go to all four, all, all four sub phases. I want to milk this battle for every casualty I can. Um, the uh, let's I guess talk about. Um, so we got about a half an hour left. Okay, let's have a discussion about what I learned, um, what I've learned in. Um, in the campaign leading up to Gettysburg, not that there was much of one. There was just second Winchester and then Gettysburg. But um, there were some lessons that I, I picked up coming out of Chancellorsville. One of them being that uh, it's okay. I have this. Ver I have a very aggressive play style compared to some of the other streamers, um, and it works. It's fine. I, it, 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 it gets me. Uh, I take higher casualties. Okay, fine. Um, but pretty often I get. 100% kill ratios as well. And um, I had experimented prior to Gettysburg with um, being a bit less aggressive. And it 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 didn't sit right with me. And uh, um, then I kind of went too far the other direction. I got too aggressive. And that called, or cost me very heavily. Very, very heavily. And um, one of the really, really great things about this game is that it will it will support a number of different playstyles. You can build different armies that will fight different ways. Um, I think something Compass is kind of famous for um, being the uh, the artillerists general. I would say, uh, and then I watch um, you know I watch Asia's videos and he's he's very dynamic and very aggressive and uh he's got this big swarm of cavalry just you know it's this big brute squad going around bullying the battlefield it's really fascinating to watch um to watch his playthroughs and um what i'm trying to do is sort of be this almost this like synthesis of those two things so i still have plenty of guns and everything like that i still have plenty of cannons um but I'm trying to maintain a pretty dynamic uh, front line. I, I like to um, the ideal battle for me is one where I'm able to knock the enemy onto his back foot and then continue to close the gap at every possible point and never give him a chance to collect his bearings. If I'm playing this game, um, and I've had battles that that uh, I, I've had fights play out that way, where I've been very happy with the outcome, where 
uh, I put the foe on his back foot and then he never has a chance to recover. Um, and I think the synthesis of that was actually Chancellorsville. Uh, where I reined my aggression in because at the end of the day, all of the aggression in the world does me no good and usually just gets my guys killed if I don't behave prudently, if I don't take into a fact or consideration that they're exhausted, if I don't take into a consideration that that unit has no officer and that unit's at half strength. And, you know, these kind of factors matter and I have to take them into, into account when I'm um, looking at the battlefield. And so I think Chancellorsville was probably my best battle to date yet by a pretty far margin um, for two reasons. One, uh, I kept my aggression in check. I was still aggressive. Uh, I still sought the enemy's flank at every opportunity. I am, I'm always doing that. Like I'm watching my, I, I watch my videos and I, I, I very aggressively, try to find the enemy flank and punish him for having one. Um, and, and I did that at, at Chancellorsville. I did that at Chancellorsville where I sought the flank and I pushed it at every chance I had. But Chancellorsville was one of the first battles on a big scale where I was extremely conscious and I'm still not good at it. I'm still not nearly as good at it as I want to be, but I'm, I saw, as I'm watching myself play Gettysburg, I see myself taking, into, taking it into account far more than I used to. Um, at Chancellorsville was the first time I was truly like uh, aware or conscious of it's better to hold the aggression in check for five or ten in-game minutes to have your troops fully rested when you do commit them. Um, and I do it here, too. I, I rest uh, ad hoc divisions. Because um, I'm, I'm not really good. I, I had this moment in time where I really wanted to keep all of First Corps' First Division together as one unit on the battlefield. And then, you know, it just it made me feel very inflexible. And so... Um, I've stopped doing that. And so now I'm kind of forming these ad hoc um, kampf groupings, just just quick battle groups of really, I, I think it's kind of whatever's available at the time, whatever's nearby. And, and this is the whole point, I think, of, I, I say it like it's this bad thing, but that's the whole point of the mixed order army strategy. The whole point is I can take any collection of units anywhere in the line and they should perform more or less and that's the important distinction more or less like you would expect and generally speaking I have felt that that has been the case this is the, the last gasp of the confederacy right here is, is, a, is a very impressive kind of all across, the, all across the line charge that is doomed to fail before it even starts um yeah, units are, are breaking almost immediately on contact. Some of them shatter. Uh, so back to lessons, because I, I, I don't know. I hate to say it, but I got, I got by this point, I was just sort of bored. Um, the whole point that I've, I've been trying to say since I started talking about my strategy for army composition has been that you be able to take any collection of units and take them anywhere and do anything with them. And generally speaking, I felt like that was working. Um, but then for a little bit of time, I was like, yes, but I want to keep all of third core together and I want to keep first, first division within third, third core together. And that I think defeats the purpose of this sort of aggressive, um, ag aggressively flexible style that I'm coming up with uh, on the screen. I had, a uh, 7th Cavalry and a screen of skirmishers intending to charge that battery. But then I realized I might trip the... I actually, not might. I probably would trip that objective or that flag. And I don't want to do that here because then the battle ends. 
and I wanted to have a chance tomorrow to mop up all the extra casualties. So I abort um, that attack, and then I realize I've got 28 in-game minutes, so it's just not gonna it's not gonna matter, and uh, let it let it just kind of go. Um, so back to lessons learned. Um, I to my personal read, I think mixed order is a huge success. Uh, um, at least for my personal play style, I, and, and, and then that's, you know, you got to take that into account when you're coming up with how you want to build your armies. There are players. Spectrum is one of the better ones, um, for this kind of thing who are really, really, really good about milking, um, just stupid performance out of 250 or 300 man three-star units like he just the way that he plays what he manages to do with some of these units is just mind-boggling and i'm a little bit more of a blunt instrument than that <laughs> it's, it's it sounds like it's a bad um uh like i'm putting myself down when i say that like i'm just not that good i'm not i'm not that good at micro but uh, where I think that my personal strengths lie, and this is why I like mixed order, is is when I watch myself play, I feel as if I have a really solid grasp of on the overall flow of a battle, and more importantly, the timing within it. When when a good time to launch a divisional counterattack is, when a good time to get online is, when a good time to do this, that, that and all these kind of things that kind of awareness or, or macro perspective is is just as important as the ability to micro and 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 spectrum's micro is great and and something compass's micro is great um he's very cautious and very uh, methodical and that gets him these just incredible results in terms of the battlefield and 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 someone else i want to say it was something compass has commented that this game allows for multiple different play styles and so that's that's cool. Um, unfortunately, at this point in the battle, like it just kind of, eh, I don't know. Gettysburg as a battle is so defensive from the Union perspective that it's occupied good terrain, win the battle. So I didn't really have a chance here to to really kind of utilize some of those things. And I know my, my early portion of day one was bad. Like, I think it was bad. Um, I, and I So that's like a personal note. Like, I'm not good with skirmishers. I'm just not um, as effective with them as I have seen some other players be with them. So, again, personal um, stylistic notes. But it is what it is. Mm. Other lessons learned. Uh, more second Winchester, but a little bit um, a little bit in Gettysburg as well. Be very careful about um, two things. One, collateral damage. We talked about this um, with regard to my musketry on a collateral measure hitting um, the general at Second Winchester, whose name I've since forgotten. Um, but also collateral in terms of shell uh, or shrapnel damage into my artillery units. It cost me several guns. Um, in my artillery in Second Winchester, and it's cost me an entire battery of of twenty four pounders in this battle, and that's collateral damage. Um, second is be very careful about what the game thinks a spot of terrain is. That's it's huge. Like I can look at a map and I can look at what I can look at the town of Gettysburg and I can be like, this is where the town's edge is, and and visually I'm I'm like I think I'm right. But the game is coded such that anything over this fence line and in is um, is the uh, urban terrain. So less and less and less. And one, collateral damage. So sp spread your shit out, which is a thing they taught me in the army. So I should be, I should be better about that. And then two is... Um, really really know the terrain and this game does it does give you the tools if you just hover your your mouse over terrain it'll tell you a little blurb this is open terrain this is wheat fields this is grass this is you know fuck a house like, whatever 
Um, I, I do wish the game was a little better about letting you occupy farmhouses and whatnot, but whatever. Um, so here we're at the kind of the, the final cleanup phase. One of the things that I think is really great is that they let you decide to end it immediately. Like the, the minute the mission has one minute on the clock and then you can click finish whenever you want. And the game explicitly tells you, you can end the battle whenever you want. Um, I think that's fantastic. Uh, now, I take that a little too literally because you can end the battle whenever you want. It, there's still a flag. If you take that flag in the middle, you win, you win, finger quotes, the battle, and you don't have the opportunity to continue wiping out the rest of the force. So I've got my uh, cavalry brute squad here. It's, it's the light division of First Corps running around just murdering stuff is a big kind of, you know, well, I mean, brute squad. And probably I would imagine in the um, next time that I play this this game and run through a campaign, I'll probably, um, I like, I really enjoy this, this mob um, <laughs> strategy for cavalry where, where you've got one or two units of traditional cavalry and one or two units of dragoons. Um, and you know, like I keep using them in these as this big melee blob. So why not just make a lot of sword cav? And, and like I've thought about that too. There's a number of times, however, especially in the smaller battles, where the ability to rapidly get somewhere, dismount, fight on foot, and then you know mount and move somewhere else has been useful to me. Especially I think at Gaines Mill, um, or no, sorry, more Malvern Hill than Gaines. Although Gaines also. Um, both of those battles, uh, dismounted cavalry have been instrumental to um, the army's performance from the Union perspective, and I would imagine the same is true for the Confederate one um, as well. So uh, I, when I'm playing out the, the last portion of the battle here, I want to anchor my force with the guys behind the trenches over in the center and then use everything here down in the south to rotate around it and then push up the side of my own line um, and and scrape the Confederate army into the top right corner of the map, trap it there and crush it. And what um, happens in the actual event is that um, I trip the flag and and you know, win the battle. Okay, fine. So, um, still the union performance here has been an unmitigated, just a, a major success. Um, notes for my army going forward is one, um, I'm going to be beefing up my counter battery, um, capacity. Uh, I have been saying for a while now in these videos that the Confederate artillery has really become a force, force to be reckoned with, and that is still absolutely the case. Um, more so, I would imagine. You take a look at what I what I capture at the end of this battle. I think it's like 12, 10 pound parrots or something like that. Like you get a lot of guns in this fight. You get a lot of heavy cannon that I that I killed in this fight. Um, a, a, a bunch of C.S. Richmonds, a, a bunch of uh, Tyler Texases, which is interesting because I didn't get the impression that that was a terribly, a, a terribly wide, widely produced gun. And especially given the fact that the Union had cut access to the Mississippi, I'm also surprised how much of that, you know, the, the army here is having because I would imagine it would be hard to get weapons manufactured in Texas to the army in in Virginia, but maybe not, um, you know, blockade runners and whatnot. So, um, yeah, there's not a lot of interesting stuff to talk about as far as what's happening on the map. I, I have, uh, been very careful to advance in a manner that is, uh, slow enough that, the infantry has a chance to rest. I, I'm working to keep them as supported with artillery as I possibly can. Um, I am trying not to sit for over long in one one spot. Um, so I'm trying to keep things dynamic and fluid and, and mobile. Uh, and you know, like at this point in time, like I outnumber the Confederates so strongly that why? 
what I should be doing in this time is at the same time as I'm attacking here in the center, um, I think I should be attacking north at the same time. I don't know. It's over open terrain and they're behind stone walls. So, you know, I just spent all this time talking about like, well, I don't think they ever should have gone into the attack at, uh, at Pickett's Charge. And so like my thought process is to utilize these forces here um, and then sweep that Confederate position in the north of the map from their right, uh, which is to say attacking from the other side of, of uh, Gettysburg itself. And, and and I think that would have been fine if I hadn't tripped the flag and the clock had run down and whatever. So there's some troops that I don't get that I would have gotten. And it's like, it's like, it's like 2000, whatever. It's not that big a deal. Um, we get this force in the middle here and it's just, this is what I'm, I'm doing. I'm surrounding it from every possible side. I'm blasting it into oblivion. Um, and a lot of them are now that the artillery is online to support it. A lot of them are just gone, gone. They, they morale break and they call it a day and then I, I continue the attack. Um, Artillery is in position to support infantry, cavalry, light skirmishers, all that kind of stuff. It's a pretty, you know, large block of troops and I don't realize that the clock is counting down and I've got 11 minutes now or whatever in game to kind of play this all out. Um, so, and, and, you know, live and learn. I think we're coming up at the end of the battle. I hope that um, any of the rambling here has proven to be at least even remotely interesting. I know I've gotten wildly off topic a couple of times. If you have the ability to watch the series 1864, um, it's in, I, I want to say German or Danish, or probably both actually. Um, it, it came out I mean, a couple of years ago. It was one of the more expensive uh, productions to come out of Denmark. And it's it's, everything that I've read is that it's period accurate. It's very interesting. It's very well done. And it's a very um, telling look at combat in this era. And one that, I mean, it happens in 1864. It's not that far off. And the guns that they're using aren't terribly different from the ones that are used on our end of it. it takes a look at the battle of, um, and I'm, I'm going to butcher the name here, Diebel. Um So yeah, we get 17 10 pound parrots. We get a, a brigade's worth of Richmond's two brigades worth of Texas's, um, a whole crap load of that Enfield carbine, which I love, uh, 10,000 to 56,000 or so. Uh, that's just the infantry. I didn't take a look at their cavalry artillery numbers. So I can run those numbers at some point in time in the, in the, uh, again, in the aftermath, but I'm not that worried about it. It was a little over, call it six to one, five to one, somewhere in that range. So I'm okay with those numbers. They're fine. Um, preparations for, uh, fire Bosch, whatever it's, it's, it's in somewhere in the South. The next battle before Chickamauga is basically free. Um, by which I mean, I'm able to replace all of the losses with rookies without significant effect on, uh, the stats of the units. And then I utilize guns I've already got. Um, the reputation rewards at this point offer me 2000, um, Springfield 1863s, which I buy and then allocate to the iron brigade. Um, additionally, um, oh, so my howitzers leveled up and I buy them the long range training, which before you freak out, my thought process is their canister is already stupid. The 24 pounder already has the most insane canister in the game. So if I can buff the, uh, I'm not worried about the solid, um, sh solid shot, but I want to buff their shell yes, as well. Put some rounds into logistics because um, more ammo is better, all that kind of thing. I, I'm going to put points into politics eventually, but I haven't done it yet. So another thing is that I we're not getting any more Harper's Ferries. So I'm going to need to start transitioning the army from Harper's Ferries over to uh, 1861s. And that'll happen in whatever process. And I'll, I'll sell off, you know, like... A lot of the streamers talk about selling off Fayettevilles because it's a shitload of money and you never get enough to, to field a whole unit with them. So why not? So I'll, I'll probably do that. I'll, I'll sell off the Fayettevilles and buy 61s or, or whatever. Um, but the, the, the army did excellent. Some of the units got beat the hell up and back again. That's I'll, I'll manage. Um, we can bounce back from these losses. Uh, I'm going to get the rest of the army, you know, cleaned up. A bunch of units picked up their second star, some their third. Awesome, awesome stuff. And um, 
without further ado, once again, I hope that you have enjoyed the Battle of Gettysburg. I, I apologize for being down on it. I think it's kind of I get to being like, oh, it's boring. Um, but sitting behind defenses and then having the enemy charge at me gets kind of, I don't know, bold. So I'm glad the army did as well as it did. I'm glad we got the kind of kills we got, uh, all that kind of thing. But the next engagements are going to be... Um, Chickamauga is the next big battle, and then there's a word I have a hard time pronouncing. Um, that's that's the next one. So, Fiasco, uh, signing out once again. I hope you guys had a great time, and I will see you in the next video. Have a good one. Oh, their army numbers are down to uh, 50,000. Huge, huge hut, huge hit. That's a massive knockoff from where they were at before. So that's, that's I'm, like, they're, their manpower is starting to have some serious problems. So cool. See you in the next video.